Hello, and welcome back to the Philip Crit. I'm starting a couple of minutes early because I just want to double check something. I'm experimenting a bit with the sound. Observe. Experimenting a bit with the sound. Observe. Experimenting a bit with the sound. Okay, it seems to work. So that's good. Um, <clears throat> right, welcome back. Just a bit of a plug for Scott Buckley's work. Uh, all of his music is accessible on YouTube. I hope it's not too loud. But I thought it would be nice to maybe just have some background music here. And as we go back to Genesis 27. Today, I, I still have my Epic pen, so we can, we can um, underline things and do the like. But I think I'm just going to be using Bible Hub for today because I haven't had as much time as usual to prepare some resources and, and to do like a proper written out translation. So it might not be as well refined as the last episode, although that one was pretty chaotic as well. As a matter of fact, this might go even better. That's why I'm, <laughs> I'm trying it out. I'm also really busy in recent times, so I'm uh, just so that you are aware, I'm just doing this in order to get some more of Genesis done, working through the, the original Hebrew, which will also play a more prominent role in this episode. But first, let's read through our sections so that you've got an idea of what the what the story is, the two sort of narrative arcs that we're going through. Esau's lost hope. <laughs> Sounds really dramatic. And then Jacob escapes from Esau. So this is Jacob Esau's lost hope? No. <laughs> or maybe. Depends how you interpret it. But let's let's begin. I can zoom in a bit here so it's easier to read for you. Maybe even more. There we go. Great. So let's let's begin. Now it happened. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? That's my version of Isaac. So he said, I am your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him. And indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me also, O father. But he said, Your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And now, look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. With grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Very interesting. Let's also read part two already, and then we can look at, at them in more in greater de detail. But this the story is quite interesting. So there's a second blessing, but it's, it's slightly different to the, the blessing of the firstborn. It's like the abundance that God has when he blesses, that it, it sort of like fills up the goblet that's on top. But if you think of these like goblet pyramids, I don't know what they're called, <laughs> that you have at parties sometimes, like you fill the first glass and then it overflows and then it fills the glasses underneath and so on and so forth. 
Um, and so it is also with the firstborn. His blessing, a few truly is blessed, fills him up and becomes a blessing to those around him, which we also saw with the promise to Abraham and so on in Genesis 12, for example. But God makes it a couple of times and also to the patriarchs, the other patriarchs, as we've seen. So then, verse 41 onwards. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Surely your brother Esau comforts himself concerning you by intending to kill you. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, arise, flee to my brother Laban in Haran, and stay with him a few days, until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you, and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereaved also of, both, of you both in one day? Goodness. Difficult to read a bit from today. And Rebecca said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob takes a wife of the daughters of Heth, like these, who are the daughters of the land, what good will my life be to me? Also a pretty intense thought. And that's how, how the chapter ends according to the Masoretic text. Let's go back up here. And take a closer look. Let's actually look at the Hebrew as well. Can I open that in a separate tab? Yes, I can. So I will do this. I hope you are doing well. Actually, I can't even see the chat, so if anyone is watching, let me open that quickly. And then we can look at this in Hebrew. Ah, that's not exactly what I wanted. Let's go back first. We can also look at the Septuagint. So here he says, Vayhi ka asher kila yitzchak le varech et Yaakov, Vayhi ach yatso yatsa Yaakov me et pene yitzchak aviv ve esau achiv ba mitzedo. You could probably follow that in English as well. Uh, which is good. So the blessing here is obviously very important. And then the savory food is, plays a role again. I think one of the important motifs that came up here, which I found quite interesting, was that... Um, let me just see if I can do this. No, that doesn't work. Okay, but one of the important motifs again was the bread and the wine. And Isaac says that he sustained Isaac with the bread and the wine, so that the bread and the wine are like the blessing of Isaac, but made manifest, which is also very similar to um, the Eucharist. And I find that quite interesting with grain and wine. Because bread. Um, Grain and wine. Grain is like the raw form of bread, and then the vine, so the the grape is the raw form of the the vine. Which then both become refined through uh, the process of refining, so through treading the grapes and so on, and through grinding down the, the grain. And out of this uh, refining process, which is like a, a process of judgment, so I'm just going to write a refinement equals it's a judgment process and the hebrew word for judgment is oops my pen is doing strange things but the hebrew word is niche but which also means something like pattern or design or something in those in those ways so so through the design or the process the 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 judgment of the refining of the grain and the grape, you get out of that the refined products which are easier for the human being to consume 
and which also have something like festive quality to them because you can eat the bread at the festival and you can drink the wine at the festival as well and one can think there may be a little bit of the, the passover which is a very central um, festival that develops out of out of this later and um, on the way into the exodus according to God's purposes. So we've got like a foreshadowing of what then comes to fruition in, in the Passover meal over here already in the rituals that the fathers have been given since Adam by God. And that then further develops through God's divine guidance to become the Passover festival, which is then foreshadowing naturally of what we have in Christ, which is great. So that was one big thing that I wanted to just take out of here again. We did speak about it last time. Um, but otherwise, there are also quite a lot of interesting other things over here. So first, again, the, the relationship between the father and the son. So let my father arise and eat of his son's game. This is also quite interesting to me. I've been thinking a little bit in recent times about animistic religions and how they are really a very secular attempt or like a worldly attempt to reconstruct uh, what we have in the trinity with the, the father the son and the spirit um without divine revelation because divine revelation would be that which kind of like breaks in from above into the mundane reality so here if this is a mountain, sorry, I need to explain these diagrams as well, but say this is heaven and this is earth down here. Then you've got the divine realities kind of breaking into the secular world and manifesting themselves sacramentally. That's why the institutions of the church are so important. I see my connection is bad. I hope that will change. But yeah, so we've got something like that also in the language of creation being expressed here that that the father and the son um have this relationship with one another so the father arises there, there's often mentions in the psalms um where god is called to and and there's this uh it's like an imperative where one says arise o, o lord um a wild boar has entered your vineyard for example or something along those lines and then God, as the father arises from where he was sitting comfortably, supposedly, or I don't know what, lying in his bed as Isaac is doing, and he becomes strong again to save us. And that's also a common recurring motif throughout, like Judges, for example, where God arises and sends his, um, I, I don't think the word arise is necessarily used there, but he, I think it is used in the he feels or something, he, he raises up a, a judge to save Israel from there their oppression and now we've got the son um, who brings the offering so there's also a priestly role that the son plays so the son in many ways is like a priest and this is the role of the house father as well um, which is very interesting because here the father becomes the son if one thinks of it like this then the house father is the one who prepares a sacrifice on behalf of his family, that's why sacrifice. May my prayers rise as incense before thee. So the, the father prepares a sacrifice on behalf of his family. I'm just going to write on behalf, like that, of the family, of the fam, squad fam. <clears throat> no. <laughs> but by doing that, he he brings atonement for his family. Um, before the Heavenly Father, and by bringing it before the Heavenly Father, the House Father becomes the Son again. And this is the role that, that Christ as the Son, we see that in Hebrews as well, and so on, where he plays the role of the High Priest. Is it Hebrews 11? I might be wrong. You can correct me on that. Um, he plays the role of the High Priest, or John 17, or all of these famous places, on our behalf and brings, represents us before the Father in such a way that it is God-pleasing. He brings all of our sacrifices to him. 
And in the new covenant, these sacrifices, before they were animals and so on, the, the purest, most spotless thing that could be offered, the greatest that we had. Now it's that still is the case with tithing, for example. That's the opportunity that we have to to give our best to the church, to the Son, to God, um, that he might use it as a blessing to the rest of the the congregation and then also the world around surrounding the congregation. Um, so that the sacrifice becomes a blessing to all of those that, that participate in it. So you've got this happening within the congregation, but it sort of spills over again. Kind of like with the goblet, if you've got one on top, and then you've got like three holding that one up, and then maybe like ten underneath that, and it like flows and overflows and flows into all of the different goblets and fills them up consecutively. So that the, the head of the house plays the, the primary role in mediation, and that's the priestly priestly role again. So we've got that happening here a little bit. And the father then is supposed to either recognize or reject the son, the, the offering of the son. And we have that with Cain and Abel as well. And there are uh, lots of similarities between Jacob, Esau, and Cain and Abel as well. So that's quite an interesting observation to make there, I think. Yeah, so we've got the house father. And Esau, who wants to become the next house father as the firstborn son. And he's also, interestingly enough, following the command of his father uh, to the letter. And there's also a lot of comparisons that are made to Esau. I know in the prophets, Jacob, I loved Esau, I hated, for example. We'll still get to the prophets with the image of the oak that's been brought up here. Um, but with Jesus as well, that's, that Esau is the, could be connected to the Pharisees. And Jacob is connected more to the actual children of Abraham, who are those that are in faith in the living God. Um, and here we've got, th this might actually be interesting to look at in the Hebrew, the word here is kum. See, it's kum. Might not even necessarily have to look at it right now, but but it's definitely worth looking at in, in your own time if you need to. And then may your soul, this is your nefesh, so your throat actually. May your throat bless me. Um, Baruch. Baruch atah melech haolam. This is how the, the daily prayers of the Jews begin, I think. Oops, excuse me. Uh, so, blessed are you, king of the universe, or of the age. Great. So then, his father, Isaac, let's just give you the words, said to him, who are you? And this is also interesting. I mean, the fact that he doesn't recognize his firstborn son because um, because he's blind is so it's so interesting. If one reads the spiritually and not only um, historically or literally as it as it is, or if one reads it literally in the sense that Christ is the literal meaning in the text, which one always should do, then here we again have this manifestation of the Word of God, which is. The second person of the triune god but he brings the whole trinity he reveals to us the trinity the second person of the of the of god is the one who reveals the trinity to us in the first place so so we've got the son here who's showing us who the father is and the father is blind to the outside um which is em emphasized in the apostolic teaching uh, especially in the letter of james for example where he says do not look at the exterior um <laughs> if someone is wearing golden rings, for example, but uh, look at the heart, which one has with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in a very clear way as well, and in the prophets, naturally. So he doesn't see Esau based on his external accomplishments or his external um, appearance. I mean, Isaac would have, right? That's the, that's the thing that the spiritual underlying reality to this history is that the father doesn't, doesn't look at that. And in some ways, I wonder if that's why he blinded Isaac. He intentionally blinded him towards the external because that's the only thing he was focusing on. So that um, Isaac would have to bless Jacob who had who had deceived him according to the word of Rebekah. And there we again have this interplay between the instance of doves and the, the cunning of serpents. It's very interesting. So he, he trembles exceedingly 
Isaac, and the shows that he is afraid. He's done something that cannot be reversed. It has consequences. And he's been deceived not only by Jacob, but also by God in a lot of ways, because God wanted originally intended to, to bless Jacob. And here we see that the plans of the fathers that we have on earth, our earthly fathers, and again, this, this puts the fourth commandment into its proper context, I think. Our earthly fathers are meant to be priestly mediators of the, the heavenly father. And that's why Jesus, for example, also says very poignantly um, in, in Matthew 23, for example, just waiting for the connection again. Sorry about that. Might take a while. There we go. I think it should be okay now. But he, he says, uh, um, call no one on the earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. So, yeah, the point is that Isaac understands himself to be a part of something that is greater than he is, that he doesn't just belong to himself, even as, as a father, as, as a man and so on. He doesn't just belong to himself, but rather he embodies that which is heavenly within the world. And whenever he veers from this true path, from this heavenly path, um, he will have to pay the consequences. And Isaac, we know, is very, like, upright, I think, in his living. At least he doesn't, we don't have any dramatic stories of how, well, I guess there's the story where he goes to Egypt. Or no, to, to the land of the Philistines, I think. Um, so, okay, we do have some stories that are a bit worrisome with him in terms of his character. But, but he's otherwise very boring, if I can say it like that, in contrast to Jacob, for example. So he seems to want to do everything according to his... To the teaching of Abraham. Um, and that's why he trembles, I imagine, among other reasons. But there's, there's, he, he is held accountable to a very high standard, and he is aware of this. So Esau then hears the words of his father, because his father says, indeed, he shall be blessed. So he's not taking this back at all. He's just emphasizing the fact that the blessing that he has spoken over Jacob is truly going to take effect. And then Esau hears the words and he cries with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. Um, and he says to his father, bless me, me also, O father. So he also wants to be blessed. And it seems like in his behavior, I think that came up a little bit with uh, Pastor Baron Wolfmuller's read, read through of Luther's commentary on Genesis, which you can take a look at on his channel. Uh, that's really worthwhile and he does them live on wednesdays i think so so if you if you want to and can join that then i recommend um but there he was also commenting luther was commenting on how esau is kind of like churlish and he doesn't really think about how valuable these things are like the blessing for example so these things that have been passed on for generations from father to son these things he kind of deals with carelessly and he is willing to sell his birthright for example for lentil soup which is something transient in contrast to these everlasting traditions in, in some ways at least the birthright that belongs to the house of abraham is everlasting because it ends up leading to christ who establishes um the sonship or the heirship that is eternal in the church which we all participate in so esau kind of dropped the ball on this one i think uh and it should also be a warning to us to to Pay attention to the things that are that are older than we and not to you know deal carelessly with him yeah so so he also wants to be blessed but but he won't get the blessing that he's looking for and then comes the deceit of of uh of jacob again a recurring theme and what else do we have and esau said it is not is he not rightly named Jacob, which is the one who grabs the heel? I guess there's a bit of a wordplay here in the in the Hebrew. Well, they've got the notes here. Supplanter or deceitful, literally one who takes the heel. So the one who takes the heel, I think we've come across that in a, a different text as well. But he's the one who's always like, he's standing behind you, he grabs the heel, he's kind of sneaky. He causes you to, to trip and fall. Um, which is interesting, 
it's also a recurring motif throughout the i mean i keep saying it's interesting but it is it's a recurring motif throughout scripture I'm having difficulty with the scrolling here. Anyway, that seems to be working now. Uh, he took away my birthright, now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? And then he, so this is also interesting. So the younger will be greater. That's what God promised to Rebecca, as we saw earlier in the text. And he says, I've made him the master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. So it includes Esau, but it seems like there are other brethren. I don't know exactly how to how to read that. Maybe he had other um, concubines and so on, like his father did, and those just aren't mentioned. Or maybe it includes the cousins. Maybe it includes the sons of um, Ishmael and so on. So it's interesting. Uh, or maybe it's just also in case of future brothers but brother can also be understood a bit further in, in the hebrew so that it can also mean things like cousins or relatives in general male relatives maybe even uncles to some degree and then we come to the sacramental the grain and the wine the bread and the wine what shall i do for you my son and so this is kind of like a resignation on the part of isaac where he he's like i've given him everything i've made him your master I don't understand what more I could give to you that would alleviate the situation. And then Esau kind of uh, clings to this. He says, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me also, O oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So now Esau is like, damn, this, this is not good. Um, and he's also mourning, weeping. And then Isaac says to him, hold so he does have another blessing and this is also interesting if one thinks of jacob for example one who has the blessing of the firstborn from isaac and passes it on to 12 sons but he well he blesses all 12 sons in some cases one can ask if it really is a blessing um like with reuben for example but but he does bless them all and so you can bless everything everyone but there is still within the blessing within the possibility of the blessings that you can give there's like a hierarchy and that's what that's what one has in the in the the blessing of the firstborn the first fruits of your labor they are your greatest achievement in some way according to the design of of god i mean if you're an artist or something and you try drawing something once and then you draw a second draft the second draft might be a lot better but the first draft laid the foundations for everything that came afterwards. And in Christ, interestingly enough, we've got something similar because he is the beginning and the end. So he's the firstborn and he's the son of man. So he's also the firstborn of the new creation. And because of that new creation, um, how does this work? We've got this kind of a shape again, fractals, like fractals. But it's interesting because then we move through history, we've got the people of Israel expanding as a nation. They get big in Egypt. And then they kind of get, well, that's not a P, but anyway, Egypt, you, you know what I mean. Um, and let's just make it a, a, an ugly P. And then they kind of get, after the exile, especially, and the rebellion of, of the kings, they get winnowed, the wheat from the chaff, and it gets all reduced down to this one man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and through him the new creation is born, so that he's the firstborn of the new creation and the firstborn of the old creation, and he's kind of the last, the last man, <laughs> and the first man among new men, the last of the old men. He's like Adam, as he should have been. So, what am I saying? This is Jacob as well, a prefigurement of Christ, glorious. So you shall serve your brother and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. And oops, we've got uh, prophecies and so on concerning Edom in a lot of the prophets, especially Obadiah is one prophet who's dedicated only to Edom, which are the descendants of Esau. 
and the yoke is an image that's taken up in Jeremiah especially as well. We spoke about that on, on Lambda Bible Studies, so take a look at Lambda Bible Studies and then you'll find uh, a bit of an introduction into Jeremiah there. And this, this image is addressed. And Jesus also uses the image of the yoke to say that his yoke is, his burden is light, his, lo his yoke is gentle. I'm trying to translate it from the German there. And the yoke is a sign of slavery. If you're wearing a yoke, then you're doing the servant work for another. Then you're like a bull in the field who's, you know, dragging the plow through the dirt. You're doing the work and you're not the master of the farm. I can also maybe think of the book of Ruth, and think of Boaz as the master, and then you've got all of the servants in the field that are, that they who, who fulfill a very kind of angelic role. Um, he's the master. Boaz master, and then you've got the servant angels in some way, and especially after the, the resurrection, humanity has become more angelic in a lot of ways, and the, especially the office of the ministry, because we have such a clear revelation in, in Christ, who God is, we know him now in person, in persons, <laughs> but in, in human flesh as well. Um, the pastors of the church or the ministers of the word play a very angelic role in the world. And that is also why humanity will um, judge the angels when the time comes. Nice. So then Jacob escapes from Esau. And Esau is kind of plotting how he can take revenge because he is bitter. So here he's even already trying to break the yoke from his neck, but he doesn't. And later on, actually in the story between Jacob and Esau, we see that Esau has made peace with the whole thing. So it could also be a reference to that, that in the peace that Esau finds in reconciliation, that the yoke is broken. But one can also look at his descendants who then rise up against Israel, because the nation of Israel, the nation of Jacob then also conquers the land in which Edom dwells and reduces Edom as the enemy to be lesser than, than Israel is. And it's also interesting because in Christ, the nations are also incorporated into the, well, the body of Christ, the body of God then, and all of the nations become children of God, not only the children of Jacob. And in that, in that way, in Christ, the, the yoke is also broken, which is why the yoke in Christ is light or easy. Yeah, Rebecca has, she seems to have like a whole network of spies in the house of Isaac. It makes sense, I guess, but she's really got her ears on the ground and she's always like plotting and seeing how she can save Jacob. And that's also interesting if I now plays or takes the, the role of the mother into, especially like the queen mother in, in the stories of the kings into account and how, as we saw with St. Jerome in the, in the previous episode, how the mother also can work sometimes in some ways as a type for the spirit, even though the spirit is masculine. I mean, he's feminine in the Hebrew, which is why one can make this connection. But the spirit is the spirit of God who is masculine, because the masculine, linguistically, at least in these texts, works like an umbrella that incorporates everything inside it. So the woman is made from the man, not the man from the woman as St. Paul says, and that's also captured in the language and in the theology of especially the Old Testament, but in both Old and New Testament, because the New Testament has been planted into the Old world. So we still have to um, suffer this veil of tears, as Paul also kind of speaks about in 2 Corinthians 5. I keep quoting that one as well. At some point you'll know it. So, Now, he comforts himself. I find this quite interesting as well. That we should actually put in Hebrew. I think that would be quite interesting. Just this, this phraseology, like looking to justify himself, looking to make himself right in his own heart, um, instead of looking to God and, and getting rid of the things that burden him, getting rid of his yoke by taking it to God and asking the Lord to take it from his shoulders. He tries to remove it from himself. And he does that by intending to kill you. So 
here we've got Cain and Abel very clearly, very explicitly almost uh, referenced because that's also a story about two brothers that want to, or where the one wants to kill the other out of jealousy because the one has been accepted by the father, the heavenly father in that case, and the other has been rejected by the heavenly father. And then another thing that I find really interesting, well, yeah, so go to my my relatives and Haran until your brother's anger turns away. So the anger can also turn away. And that's also very interesting. So it's not everlasting when it comes to humans. Um, just as with God, his anger isn't, isn't long lasting. He's short. I mean, he's long, long to anger or something. Yes, and then I think the, the last thing I kind of wanted to look at. So obviously she doesn't want to be bereaved of, of them in one day. It's also interesting, this is Rebecca. And she's the one who mourns for the children in the Gospels when King Herod kills uh, kills all of the first, not the first one, the, the children of the Israelites because he's trying to kill Jesus. And so... Rebecca here is the one who's already sort of in her heart preparing to mourn for at least one of her sons, but she's like, I don't want to lose both of them. And that gets taken up in the Gospels then as well when King Herod plays this role of Cain and kills all of the younger brothers in Israel that he has been put over to rule in a, in a secular sense. Again, one has to discern between the secular authorities and the divine authorities. And then Rebecca says something that I find really interesting. She's wary of her life because of the daughters of Heth. And that's, those are the, the wives that um, Esau took to himself. And she's desperate that Jacob gets a good wife. So one who isn't of the pagans. And she says it's so important to her that she doesn't even really understand what good her life is to her. If that doesn't happen, <laughs> which is pretty intense. And again, if one if one thinks of Rebecca as a as a type for the church here, then she's also. Or if one thinks of of the pattern of of duplication that one often sees in like mandalas or fractals, where you've got like a pattern um, that takes place, and then you've got like it referencing itself over here or something, so that. It creates these weird, like, optical illusions and the like. Um, then it's almost like she's trying to duplicate herself in the relationship that her son will have with a wife in the future, which is a good thing. I think nowadays we often think of it in terms of, like, Freudian psychology or who knows what. And we think, oh, that's a weakness of the human flesh and we need to overcome that. And um, I think we almost unconsciously think in these kind of eugenic terms uh, we have to make sure that we marry this and this person and this in this way so that um, the maximum the maximum uh, potential can be reached in the children that we create so that we produce the, the superman who will replace humanity or something I don't know I think that's an underlying thought that we have based on the ide modern ideologies ide ideologies that underlie our society and our education in a lot of ways and in actual fact, I think the way it should be is that our parents help us to to realize, firstly, that they are our parents. So that should be a part of our upbringing. And that they're there to try and teach us who God is. And that they will fail us at some point, but God will not fail us. And then another part is that they should help us as guides to find spouses in this world that are, if not like them, then at least sane according to the, the word of God, which they are supposed to also teach to their children. So there's that household structure again. And it, yeah, it like unfolds itself as pattern, this judgment of God, this design in, in duplication, that the, the children become like the parents and then they eventually take over the household that their parents had and they, they are blessed by their parents as we see here and then they make an abundance of the things that their their parents have entrusted to them which we also have in the parable with the servants that the master entrusts different amounts of talents to 
The one with one talent doesn't do anything with it, and he gets punished for that. The one with the two talents makes four out of it, and the one with the five talents makes ten out of it. And and this abundance, this abundance that we have in the grace of God and his blessings, and the abundance that we can, through God's blessings, give to other people is something that, that is a big theme in Scripture. And with that, I think I would like to end it. We have been given the world, the footstool of God, has been laid at our feet because we are in Christ and he has been seated at the right hand of the Father. And that is what we are in this world. We are children of God. We walk in the dark world as lights and we don't need to be too concerned if people attack us because they're frightened of the light, <laughs> naturally. It's a frightening thing. It's like if aliens suddenly land on Earth or something um, or if an angel were to appear to you. I don't know about aliens. I know angels exist. I don't know about aliens. <laughs> but if that, like an angel were to reveal itself out of the invisible realms, you would also get a fright and, I don't know, fight or flight. Maybe you start attacking the angel or something, even though I doubt that because it would just be too traumatizing. Oops, there we go. The sound has stopped. Um, uh, yes. I am still listening. So another plug for Scott Beckley. Uh, but yeah, yes. The world is frightened of us. And that's why they overreact. Um, and you can stay calm and continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. They need it more than you. You've got it already. But, but they've got nothing <laughs> like Esau. And they desperately need something. So, yes. So keep me and the world in your prayers. I wish you God's blessing. And I pray Maranatha, may he come again quickly. Amen. I know I quickly have to end the broadcast. Goodbye. <laughs>